Tech Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. So there's a new school of networking, and the good news is it's a lot more fun. And if my case is any example, it's worked pretty well for me because I went from being completely detached, unknown mom of two kids under two down here in Milton, that's why I'm pointing that way, right? Like six miles, seven miles that way, um, to having the chance to write a book, be the CEO of a VC-funded startup, um, exit that VC-funded startup, and now work for the second fastest growing software company, HubSpot, which makes all-in-one marketing software, to answer Frank's question. Because seriously, I sold them my company and I didn't know what the fuck they did. <laughs> I was like, so what do you guys do? Um, and it's interesting, because my title at HubSpot is Inbound Marketing Evangelist, and I spend all my time talking about, guys, you can make marketing that doesn't suck. You can make marketing that people love to receive. Why not make your next brochure or website or email send good enough that someone would pay you to receive it, right? And all those principles of marketing absolutely apply in networking, right? So I tried to break it down into a couple, you know, try to get a little structure here, break it down into a couple organized principles. Organization, not my strongest point. Um, but one of the things, so, so I had that crazy experience, right? I literally convinced Guy Kawasaki that Twitter's worthwhile. If you're a marketing aficionado like me, he's like, you know, God, and like Seth Godin's the other God, and I was in a Seth Godin book without even knowing I was on the man's radar. Um, and all this crazy stuff happened because my network was getting out ahead of itself. I wasn't even necessarily strategically trying to say, well, if I have the biggest network, I'm gonna win. I just was like doing my goofy stuff on Twitter, very excited about Twitter's ability to connect people to like minds. Um, in the case of Twitter, my first use case was surround yourself with successful, interesting people. You know, like that dude in the next cubicle who's constantly taking mentoring meetings and you kind of hate him, but levels up your game for sure. Um, so all this great stuff happened. I was VC funded by Flybridge over in the very fancy building at 500 Boylston. Um, we did have an exit, which is not bad for your first time out. It was nowhere near as shiny as it looks from the outside, trust me. We had some very agonizing days as well. Those of you running startups, you hear me, you live through those, you have those ahead of you as well. Um, but now I get lots of entrepreneurs coming to me and saying, hey, you know, I noticed Armish invested in your startup. Um, would you introduce me? And I'm like, yeah, you know, do you think he gets many introductions in a year? You know, do, do you think he's maybe a little on overload? So the first piece of advice in networking that I'll give you is start with the people closest to you and work outwards, right? You are way better off with someone who's not really your target of who you need to get to know, but who already knows you, trusts you, and believes in you. And it's kind of like the six degrees of separation. Ask them who they know, who does angel investing. And that's how I started out with 140. It was like, okay, I've been lucky enough at that point already to meet some of like who I consider the absolute, you know, kind of godfathers and godmothers of technology in Boston. People like Diane Hessen, the CEO of, of CommuniSpace, and Bill Warner, who invented nonlinear video editing. You may have heard of it, right? Avid Technologies. And Dan Bridlett, who invented the spreadsheet, which you've definitely heard of if you have not heard of nonlinear video editing. And the three of them couldn't score me a single angel meeting. So, but, but what was important was they knew me and they had faith in me and they kept going and making introductions. And those were much stronger introductions than a stranger could have made, even a stranger who knew the investor way better, right? So when I introduce, introduce my friends to my angel investors because I really can say something about what's awesome about them, I get rates like, I don't know, one in six. Like it's still really crappy. So you really want to start with the people who already know you, love you, and believe in you. Let's say you're trying to find an investor, even if they know jack about investing. Because those are your strongest advocates. And it is important to work outwards towards whatever you're trying to reach from the people who know you in the first place and have a much stronger reason why they're going to go to bat to you in making introductions. Um, so start nearest to you. That's my first rule. Let me just read all the rules so you have them. Start nearest to you. 
Give before you ask. Take a lesson from the fox in The Little Prince. And be scrappy and act on all opportunities as they come. So give before you ask. Um, this one I wasn't that cognizant I was doing until I heard an interview with Brad Feld later on. Um, so this guy named Andrew Warner who does all these Mixergy interviews. Any Mixergy fans here? Yeah. Andrew's an amazing interviewer. I'd never go into a Mixergy interview unprepared. Um, my most recent one will air soon and you'll see what I mean because I told him everything about everything that had ever happened to me. It's kind of tell-all. Um, so Andrew's this awesome interviewer and he had me on to talk about 140 when we were at our absolute top of, you know, we just announced our Series A, everybody thought we walked on water, everything seemed so easy, and he's all like, how do you be on I'm like, oh, it's so easy. But I wasn't, hopefully I was a little more humble than that. Um, but one of the things he asked about was, oh my God, you have this huge network. I mean, I kid you not, I had an enormous network the day I even thought I might want to do a startup. And believe me, I was very Elle Woods, and legally blonde fans here. Come on, don't be afraid. It's a great movie. There's a scene in the movie where they look at each other and they go, Do you think she just woke up one morning and decided to go to Harvard Law School? Like, I just kind of woke up one morning and said, Yeah, I'm really going to be an entrepreneur. Let's, let's, let's see how this software thing works. Um, so, one of the questions Andrew asked me, and then later asked someone who had helped me a bunch, was like, Why mentoring? How to build a network? And the person he asked was Brad Feld, who's one of my absolute heroes. He's a VC out in Boulder. He has really strong Boston roots, and he comes here often. If you ever get the chance to see him here, go out and check him out. Really sweet guy, really smart guy. And Andrew's like, why, why mentor people? Why would you help like a, like a Laura Fitton, for example? And I was like, oh my god, I'm going to find out. Why you help me so much? And he's like, well, she's like spazzy, but he's a bit nicer. Um, he's like, she's putting all this energy out there and she's just constantly trying to help people and trying to contribute to the system. And she did that for years before she ever asked for anything back out of it. And that just made her so much easier to help, right? So think about what can you do that makes you that much easier to help? Whether it's just showing your commitment to something, literally helping other people first before you ask for something, um, promoting other people's work before you ask for a favor from them. And by the way, be careful because that one can get brown nosy real fast. You don't want to just, you know, kiss up and kiss up and be like, hey, help me. I've been kissing your butt. Um, but it's a much more subtle, I mean, the reason I think people helped me was I was like eyes on fire and froth coming out of my mouth, hell bent, that software based on Twitter was going to change the world. And by the way, I wasn't wrong about that. I didn't know how to make that into a business through an app store, but that has absolutely proved to be the case. And, and you know, I think one of the reasons people wanted to line up and help and lift that cause up into the air was that it was exciting. And also, it was kind of a strategic asset for me that I was heavily bullied in school and had gotten kind of post, I care what you think about me. That's a good place to be when you're networking. You know, I mentioned about the hands-on thing later, where I want you to say hi to someone, and if they're a douche to you, like, laugh and be smug, because, you know, you're the one doing your job, we're all here to network, you shouldn't let anybody make you feel bad. Um, but seriously, the more there, long before you start hitting people up for favors, it's going to help you. So start closest to you, give before you ask. Gotta remind my notes here, sorry. Um, the fox and the little prince. Any Little Prince fans here? You read the book? Come on. All right, everybody put your hands up. Just put them up. You don't have to read The Little Prince. All right, now put them down. That breaks the ice. Who has read The Little Prince? Le Petit Prince. Antoine Exupéry. Um, I'm very excited for my daughter to read it in French because she goes to French immersion school. There's a chapter in The Little Prince. It's this little kind of boy who's landed on Earth and he's from outer space. And so he asks lots of beautiful young child, you know, dumb questions like, what is this? What is that? And at one point a fox approaches him and he's like, oh, you're very pretty. I want to play with you. Come play with me. And the fox is all like, yeah, da, 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 da. I'm a fox. And the little prince is like, okay, you're pretty. I want to play with you. And the fox is like, no, 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 no. I am not tamed. You must tame me first. 
what does this mean, to tame? And the fox says it is a practice under, he doesn't say underutilized, but he means underutilized by humans, <laughs> in which you get to know someone first. And he says, what I want you to do is come every day at four and just sit over there. Do not approach me, do not ask me for anything, do not try and play with me. Okay, they asked me for anything is a little networking thing I worked in there, but really he just says, just come every day and then after time I will start to become excited when it's almost four o'clock because I will know you are coming, right? And so he spends a long time in this process of being known by the fox and being seen by the fox without ever asking for anything. Right? And that can be hard to put in practice with networking, especially at a one-night event, right? You know, maybe at a one-night event, it's make eye contact a couple times before you storm somebody. Um, but I can give you a real-world example where this worked in ACES for me. I had gone to a conference called Le Web in 2007, in December, in France. And one of the people I sure as hell knew I wanted to meet was blogger Doc Searles, who was one of the authors of the Clutrian Manifesto and had recently moved to Boston. So I'd been at an event with him, I had chatted with his wife, I'd seen him and made eye contact, but you know, felt very shy about approaching him because I figured you know, the speaker always gets bum-rushed after the speech, right? And, and I didn't want to be that person invading his private space when he had just given us so much. So we're at this conference together in France, and I kept running into him, we ended up at a dinner together, he actually took some, some photographs of me, and I still use them as, as headshots, because he was photographing the whole room. Um, and it wasn't until the next day I finally approached him after a talk, and I said, hey, I hope I haven't crossed into the borderline of being rude, because I know I've seen you, and we've been at events together a bunch of times, we've made eye contact, um, but I really don't like approaching people who are in demand as much as you are, because I feel like I'm just adding to that weight. We spent the next five hours, you know, like he grabbed his co-author, David Weinberger. We went out to dinner. We hung out in Paris all night. It was the most amazing thing. And I wonder, like, had I bum-rushed him the first three times we were in the same room, would I have gotten that much trust and kindness and openness to, like, just explore and see where it goes? Um, and he's just been a great friend ever since. He's a really nice guy. I'm very excited about his new book that's out, The uh, Intention Economy because he just really distills down into all this tech junk and tends to pull the human piece out of it really well. So that's my Fox and Prince um, hack. And honestly, one of the reasons I'm so excited about Twitter is it's a very easy, real world way to put that kind of action into play, right? I might meet Abby up here, hacker chick at an event and want to get to know her and maybe not have time at the event, but I can follow her on Twitter and wait and watch, and maybe she tweets about something I also have experience with, then I can say something to her that's relevant instead of just pitching her with my stuff, right? Maybe we both discover that we're obsessed with the color pale green. And I'm all like, yeah, well for me it's because it's my Twitter handle, and like, how did you get into pale green? And of course she's wearing a pale green sweater and purse and bracelet, so I'm totally playing off that right now. Um, the last thing I'll say is just be Super, super scrappy. Half the time that we don't get what we want, probably, I don't know, all statistics are made up on the spot, right? So let's say 95% of the time we don't get what we want. We never ask. We think of it and we don't do anything. And that's an amazing barrier that most people are stuck behind. Um, in the entrepreneurial world that I have been lucky enough to dabble in, there's a lot of talk about idea versus execution, right? We've all heard this, right? Like, oh, your idea is worthless, it's your execution that means something. And people are really skeptical of that, because they're convinced that that's true of other things, but my idea is really valuable, so sign this non-compete, and I'll tell you it. And, you know, nobody ever knows quite how to deal with that. Investors find it very awkward, because they know they can't sign non-competes. So the, the metaphor I've come up with is, you have all been in a conference room that was either too hot or too cold. No? Right. And everybody in that conference room had the same fantastic idea. It is too hot in here. We should cool it down. And a few brave souls were even willing to break the social contract and kind of turn to the earth. Hey, uh -huh, you're, you're hot? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, it's hot in here. The entrepreneur is already hacking the thermostat. And that is the difference between idea and execution. 
right? The people who are just driven to get up and go fix the situation they're in, even if it's not their job to do it, right? So, you know, bringing that back to what I mean about be scrappy and act, it is truly a gift to have that ability to see that opportunity. And you cheat the heck out of yourself when you're too afraid to try it, when you're too afraid to pursue it. And I was lucky enough to learn this really early on. I was 17 years old. I grew up in central Connecticut. It was a suburb of the insurance capital of the world. Quite a place for you know booming entrepreneurs and loud people and you know, all that stuff. Not. Um, and I was watching TV. My parents were away for the weekend. And on TV, there was thousands of young Eastern people dancing on the road. And I grew up in the shadow. You know, young people today do not understand about, I, I sound so old, but like they don't understand how freaky that was that Berlin was divided and that the Russians were totally going to nuke us any day and that this hung over our childhoods and that to see that wall coming down was like, whoa! And so I thought about going. I had enough money in my bank account, I had a passport, parents were away, and I wanted to dance on the Berlin fucking wall. And I didn't. And thank God, because someone called me out on it just six months later at summer camp. He's like, you have no idea how lucky you are to get those impulses in the first place. The vast majority of people, that stuff just doesn't even occur to them. You've got to act on that when it happens. And I would say there's probably 50 otherworldly things I've gotten a chance to do because I screwed that first one up and I learned the lesson. So, you know, in networking, it's scary, there's rejection, there's ego, there's all this stuff tied up in it. Try to get past that and just act on the opportunities as they fall. And so what if someone turns you down? Because half the time, well, I don't know, whatever. I'm not even going to pretend to make up statistics. A bunch of the time, it will end up like it ended up with Doc where, oh my god, I never could have called him and said, I'm going to be in Paris. Would you give me a five-hour evening to get to know your work better? Right? How would that have worked? <laughs> I'm getting great smiles on that one. I was like, yeah, no way. Just go with it. Be open to the serendipity. 